This is Phil Koopman with a tutorial on making your code more readable. Two important aspects of coding style are human understandability and safe programming language use. In this tutorial, we'll cover the human understandability side of things. At the very highest level, there are two main warning signs of bad coding style. First, if someone says coding style doesn't matter because their code passes all its tests, that tells you probably you have a coding style problem. Second, if code is written to demonstrate how clever the programmer is at using obscure language features, then probably it'll be difficult to understand, and again, you have a coding style problem. Source code is written for two different audiences, compilers and other people. For this tutorial, the most important point is that other people must be able to understand your code. The first important reason for this is that peer reviews won't work if nobody can understand your code. Since software bugs can be so expensive and so difficult to find, it is worth investing the time in writing code that is easy for others to understand, and in particular, easy for others to find bugs in. A famous quote on this topic is from Tony Hoare in his 1980 Turing Award lecture. What he said was, there are two ways of constructing a software design. One way is to make it so simple that there are obviously no deficiencies. And the other way is to make it so complicated that there are no obvious deficiencies. What we're saying here is that you should write your code so that there are obviously no deficiencies. In other words, it is crystal clear with minimal effort looking that there are no bugs there. Doing that might mean following rules that make writing the code a little more painful, but it will come at the benefit of reducing the chance of a bug escaping into production. Another reason that other people must understand the code is that the code will change. Especially for embedded systems, code will have to be modified and adapted for months or years or even decades after it's written. If the person modifying the code can't understand it, they'll inject bugs into it by making changes that break something they didn't understand. And don't forget, that someone else might easily be you in a few years when you've forgotten all the details of the code even though you wrote it yourself. If you have to think about whether something's right, then you should just consider it to be wrong. A starting point for making your code easy to understand is to make the text itself easy to read. All the code in a code base should have consistent formatting, including consistent indentation, braces, and headers. Coding guidelines often have rules such as the use of white space, the use of parentheses to avoid operator precedent confusion, and using spaces instead of tabs so the code looks the same when viewed on different text editors. Here is an example of code that intentionally did not follow good formatting rules. This is a program that implements a flight simulator from the Obfuscated Sea Contest. While writing flight simulator code in the shape of an airplane is cute, that's not how you want to do production code. In general, industry code tends to be a better format than that, but there is no reason for you to have inconsistent spacing and formatting because you can get tools that clean it up for you automatically. Another aspect of making code easy to read is to use appropriate comments in the code. Comments should explain what the code is doing at a high level and why you implemented it in a particular way. It should not simply paraphrase what the code says because the reader can get that from the code itself. It's important to note that the comments themselves are not a design. Rather, comments are there as supplemental material to help understand how the code was written, which is all about the implementation. We often hear, well, there's no point adding comments because they'll just get out of date. The problem there is not that comments are a bad idea but rather the developers don't see them as a useful thing and so they're not keeping them updated. So instead of avoiding comments, think about ways that comments can provide enough value that they seem worthwhile to keep up to date rather than being a hoop to jump through. A descriptive naming convention should be used that provides a consistent naming style. One common idea is that variables should be nouns and functions should be verbs or verb phrases. Abbreviations should always be consistent. 
For example, if the word length is abbreviated in one variable as LEN, that same three-letter abbreviation for length should be used everywhere to avoid confusion. One of the most dangerous things you can do with style is have different variables that have almost the same name but do different things. That's just asking for a bug. Finally, in this area, avoid magic numbers embedded in the code, such as a 3 or a 7 or something like that. Instead, use a named constant value. One of the many reasons for this is that if you have to change that constant value, and it used to be 7, and there's 100 places where there's a 7 in the code, how do you know which of the 7s was that value and which of the 7s happened to be some other value that was 7? It's a real mess to clean up, so you're always better off using a constant value that's named rather than the actual number. Finally, macros should be avoided because they're subject to tricky failure modes and easily obscure what's really going on. The simplest example of avoiding macros is that you should not use pound define to set a constant value, but rather use the const keyword with integers so that you can use the compiler support for this. Among other things, that gives you stronger type checking. Good code hygiene is like washing your hands. It might seem like a hassle, but washing your hands with soap and water is highly effective at preventing the spread of disease. Similarly, good coding style is highly effective at reducing the chance of bug escapes. To this end, your code should be modular. There should be many small source files rather than one huge main.c program file that is thousands of lines long. Ideally, there's a separate .c or .cpp file for each class or cluster of functions in the system. C code doesn't have the class keyword, but you can still do a similar thing by grouping like functions and like data structures together into separate .c files. For example, put a struct or typedef data definition along with its initializers and access methods into a single .c file, but nothing else. Only externally visible declarations should be stored in a separate .h file paired with each .c file. Conditional statements are a source of significant complexity and must be made as clear as possible. Each conditional clause should have a Boolean result. For example, if you want to test whether an integer is zero, you should compare that integer value to zero rather than relying on the C language characteristic of treating any non-zero value as true. Additionally, conditional clauses should have no side effects, including no assignments. All switch statements should have a default clause, and in most cases that default should be an error trap. If nesting should be limited to manage complexity. This is discussed further in the tutorial on cyclomatic complexity. Variables should have descriptive names that differ significantly from each other so that it is difficult to confuse them. Each variable should have the smallest practical scope of visibility and should, in general, never be globally visible. Variables should be initialized at the point of definition to reduce the effort required to check whether the variable is potentially uninitialized. The strongest typing information practical should be used to keep variable type straight. At the very least, the C language portable integer size types, such as uint32 underscore t, should be used to make variable sizes explicit. This is especially important in small embedded processors where default sizes for integers might be changeable or might be other than the 32-bit integer size that desktop programmers are used to. Generally speaking, beyond that, more type defs are better for keeping straight what's going on in terms of data typing. Interfaces should check the ranges, balance, and sanity of the variable values passed to them, including buffer overflow checks and more. Finally, many functions return error codes that are ignored by the calling function. This is generally a recipe for a system that behaves in an unpredictable way when something unusual goes wrong. It's common for embedded system programmers to be focused on optimization. 
small processors in embedded systems are often resource-starved, can be slow, have not enough memory, and so on. But it's important to remember that premature optimization is the root of all evil. It's a bad idea to start optimizing before you really need to. Generally, almost nothing in the software really needs to be optimized. Usually, it's only a couple percent of the program that is worth optimizing. Generally, if you're asking, should something be optimized? The answer is pretty much always no, unless you have compelling performance data to prove the optimization matters. Usually, there are only a couple inner loops or perhaps an interrupt service routine that really matters for performance. It's best not to optimize code that doesn't need to be optimized. And generally, it's smarter to get a better compiler rather than spend a lot of programmer time trying to squeeze performance out of compilers that generate bad code. There are two different types of problems with optimization. The first is that optimization makes it difficult to know if your code is correct. If the code is optimized and tangled and hard to understand, it's going to be difficult or impossible to find bugs. Seriously, do you want code that actually works, or do you want tricky, fast code that doesn't work? Pick one. The correct code is more likely to be safe. Ultimately, you might need to buy a more expensive CPU to make your code go fast enough. While it's common for embedded systems to be ruled by the tyranny of the bill of materials cost, think about what your volume is and what the cost really is. Another 50 cents for a CPU really doesn't matter if you're only building a thousand products. If you're building millions of products, that's a different story. But it turns out most embedded systems really don't have that kind of volume. So always go for the bigger, faster CPU instead of impossible to understand code if the economics at all allow that. The best practices for coding style aren't so much the nitty gritty details of your style guide, but rather to pick a reasonable style guide, adhere to the general principles I've discussed, and actually follow the style guide. You should be able to use available tool support for helping with things like language formatting, indentation, placement of the curly braces, and things like that. You should evaluate whether naming conventions have been followed as part of your peer reviews. And you should also, in peer review, check that adequate commenting is in place to explain the implementation and, for code that's been modified, check whether the comments have been updated accordingly. To some degree, good style is in the eye of the beholder. By this, I do not mean that anything goes, but rather that there are many possible variations of good style, and the goal of having coding style is not to have style for style's sake, but rather to avoid bugs. In particular, your style should make it hard for a reviewer to miss a problem, and even better, your style should make it easy for a tool to find a problem. You also need to have a good technical style to make it easier for that compiler to point out potential bugs, but that's the topic of a different tutorial. There are two general coding style pitfalls to watch out for. First, you should not optimize your coding style guidelines for the author. Instead, they should be optimized to make the code easy to review. It's okay to create a little pain for the author if by doing so, you can improve readability and your reviewers can find bugs more easily. A related pitfall is that you should not make it too easy to deviate from style rules. Programmers, being human, can be expected to take the path of least resistance when they perceive things are getting painful. And that might mean not conforming to style rules that are there to ensure good code hygiene and in the end, save everyone a lot of pain by finding bugs before they escape to the field.